what you just explained was my career strategy after Everybody Hates Chris. We came out of that, I was 17 and felt like I had hit a wall. Um, and when I sat down with my agents and managers, the plan was we're going to act as if none of that ever happened. We're going to go back out and beat the block as if there's nothing on the slate. We've And essentially, we said everything I get offered, we're going to turn down. We're going to go fight for everything. The Walking Dead definitely went in there and I fought for that. Dear White People fought for that, too. Detroit we worked with Catherine Bigelow, fought for that. And that's the thing. You have to put your ego to the side and whatever you're used to get hungrier than you've ever been in your life and go fight for it. Stereotypes about child stars and their longevity in Hollywood are well known. We've all heard the same tragic stories, but contrary to popular belief, there's a larger number of child actors who have beaten the odds and continued on with their showbiz journey. And these are their stories. I'm Jaleel White, and this is Ever After. All right, I'm excited to talk to this cat today. I'm gonna break my little formal voice now. I'm gonna get back in my Jay White voice. <laughs> I'm excited, man. Don't be giggling and stuff, man. They'll figure out who you are, man. <laughs> my, my guest, uh, my guest actually starred in, in Little Bill, the cartoon, as the voice of Bobby when he was a kid. I love that. I found that out. Um, he started the title character, though. Now you don't know who he is in Everybody Hates Chris. But more recently, what I'm proud of is he starred as Noah on a AMC's The Walking Dead. He's been a character regular on Criminal minds dear white people on netflix and whiskey cavalier on abc he also starred in a film called the wedding year check it out it's really really cool alongside sarah highland from modern family and the brother has been nominated six times for naacp image awards and won twice welcome my guest tyler james williams <laughs> what's up man yeah <laughs> Thank you, man. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. I ain't wasting your time, dog. I had to go check out your accolades. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> check them out. You got a nice little Kobe rap sheet there. You I know appreciate what it. I appreciate it. I try to stay busy. Uh, <laughs> I think it's funny, though. You, uh, you're going to laugh at me now, though. Um, you beat me. You've been nominated for more NAACP Image Awards than I have. But really? Yeah, you, you, I, I, only, uh, I was only nominated three times. Um, and you were nominated six times and, and, but you won twice and I beat you because I did win all three times. Uh, <laughs> <damn>. <laughs> yeah, we, uh, we, we got, I, I feel like I could have got one more of those, but that was the year that Tyler Perry dropped like six oh, yeah, shows. Yeah, yeah. That was <laughs> so, you know. The NWCP image award for people need to understand, white people need to understand. That's like the black Emmys. All right. So like yeah, yeah, all yeah. this winning Oscars and Emmys and stuff, that didn't that didn't exist back when I was a kid. And I don't really think it existed with uh when you were doing the show either. It was a no, 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 yeah, no, no. right? It was like a foregone conclusion. Well, even no Emmys for you guys. Specifically like no, that and like comedies as well, like our type of comedies, just you weren't going to get it. We got nominated for Chris for the Golden Globe in our season one and then never saw it again. <laughs> it was just never saw it again. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> like, hey, listen, at least you got nominated, brother. I didn't get to present. I didn't get invited. Um, really? I mean, people don't understand. It was really when you when you talk about the Emmys to me, you know, first of all, most people don't know that the actors submit themselves. So people mm -hmm. think that yeah. the average person out there is just kind of like, well, you're you're popular on TV, right? So you just get nominated. It's like, no, the actors submit no, themselves. No, no, no. So yeah. I remember even when I was a kid, you know, they would be like, hey, you know, who submitted Jalil for 
or Emmys, you know, around around the set and whatever. And you'd be like, my mom's mm-hmm. like, I don't know anything about that. So then even when we did talk to a couple of producers or whatever, it's like, ah, you know, Miller Boyette shows don't really win Emmys, you know. I mean, if you mm-hmm. want to do it, but, you know, it's just not really our jam. And so between the fact that Blacks weren't winning any Emmys, weren't really nominated for any Emmys, and having very nice white people tell you, you can do that if you want to, but <laughs> you, know, you just... You know, you just kind of live with this thing. Like, that's not yeah. for us. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, it's very like kind of it's understood. It's not spoken on as much, but it's very understood that, you know, uh, our shows, particularly our comedies. Yeah, you're not it's not even going to break through. So what's the point? Exactly. Um, regardless of, you know, the 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 reception that it has or the the amount of work it took, you know, to kind of get it done. Um, you know, we, you know how it is being young. We were carrying shows at 12, 13, 14 that breaks most grown people. Yeah. Um, but you know, it, it's one of those conversations that feels like we're, we're starting to push more towards where you see with like the stranger things, kids and people yeah. are like actually seeing and clocking the work that it's taking and like to really be able to pull that off. Um, I feel like we're moving there. We're moving slowly, but we're moving. You know, I just, I'm such a fan of incremental steps. So, you know, mm-hmm. I didn't even get invited to any Emmys or Golden Globes or any of that kind of stuff. And now you're revealing to me that you at least got nominated one year. So, you know, when, exactly. when you put when you put that in a proper context, that's why I'm sitting here chatting with you right now, because I'm like, I'm proud of that, that we can be well adjusted enough to have a cool enough conversation mm-hmm. about it and say, guess what? Now, there's another kid out there that's younger than us and we're going to work to get him the actual nomination. Now, maybe if, if he wins, you know, that's that's how you, that's, that's obviously an even better situation. But mm-hmm. it's those steps, they all matter for just for pushing the culture, the real culture. We're going to get really, into that, too. They really do. Um, and I'm like, you know, I think one of the things that gets misconstrued, and I'm sure you experienced it, you know, on your side as well, is that when you're younger, you don't understand what you're doing as yep. much or that somehow the work wasn't as hard if not harder yep. <laughs> and that's like that's one of those narratives we have to correct of like yeah these are like children who are standing there in front of full-fledged adults carrying your show yep. that's not that doesn't just happen that's not something that they just kind of stumbled upon and they're being cute yep. and you know being able to nail that joke and hit that line every single time there's a lot of adult actors who can't do that on a consistent basis i'm curious i'm gonna hit you i'm gonna hit you straight straight between the eyes with this one it, what episode or what season did you really feel completely connected with the process like i know the episode for me when it was like, it clicked. Dude. I now have this character. I know what people want to see mm-hmm. out of him. And I know how to even milk little bits. You know what I'm saying? I have the mm-hmm. exact episode and I'll share it with you. And I want to know, like, was there, was there a space in the first season or second season where you're like, oh, man, I got this. I'm in a rhythm. Because also, you work with Tashina Arnold, too. And I like, Tashina is just yeah. a comedy beast. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so, she's a beast. So being, she's a beast. being able to work with Tashina and play off of her, that's another woman who's never received her just due in comedy. Nah. You know what I'm saying? But nah. speak to that. I'm rapping too long. Speak to that. Um, I, You know what's interesting? I can't remember. So I don't remember anything specifically about Everybody Hates Chris. I can't tell you individual episodes. I can't do any of that. I remember them as like one long episode. Got it. Okay. Um, but I do remember the director in which I felt that with. It was Jerry Levine, who was also a child actor. I know that guy. Um, he hey, came in. okay. Yeah, you know Jerry. Jerry walked in and he was the first director, I think it was in like the middle of season one, who asked me how I felt about the scene and asked me how I felt about the lines I was saying. Because he And he was the first one to say, because this is your show. If you don't feel connected to what you're doing, then we have no show. Oh, he came at you like an equal. And... No, he dead ass came at me like an equal. And I remember I respected him so much for that because up until that point, we had a bunch of directors who were just kind of treating us like kids and just kind of like pushing us around and, you know, telling us how to do things. They tried to do line readings and all that. And we weren't we weren't playing with that. So it was around then it was somewhere in the middle of season one. Okay, where I became an active part of building this character. We would do these like huddles where we would try to find the joke. You know what I mean? Like we would do rewrites on the fly all the time. And it would be myself, Ali Leroy, Jerry, Bye-bye. and Owen Smith. And we'd be standing there. And that's when I was like really feeling connected because they were like, ultimately, it has to come out of your mouth. So if you don't get it and it doesn't land, it's not going to work anyway. 
Um, so that would have to be the first time I was like, oh, I'm like building something here and I feel rooted in him now. And I'm not just playing somebody else at a younger age. Um, when was that for you, though? For me, it was a very specific episode in season one called The Big Fix when I mm-hmm. took Laura out on a date at a French restaurant because um, it had been promised to me if I had helped Eddie with a school assignment. And um, we had the, now mine, was, we were multi-cam and you were single cam, but we had yeah. we had the block scene. So in, in, in multi-cam back in the day, at least, you always basically worked up to about a couple of scenes that paid off in, in jokes bigger than any of the mm-hmm. other scenes. And you would call that your block mm-hmm. scene. Like, okay, this is the one we got to we gotta drive home. So in this particular yeah. episode, um, the, the director, again, the influence of a director that chooses to treat a child as capable, like an adult, just yep. all the physicality. I basically had to just destroy this French restaurant. And, mm-hmm. and the interaction between me and Kelly Williams, who played Laura, um, it was the first time I could hear the audience asking me to milk jokes. Um, uh, so I could hear yeah. the audience saying, this joke can go longer than the way mm-hmm. we wrote it. And I can play this out with a little bit of ad-libbing or physicality mm-hmm. or whatnot. And the audience is rocking. Um, and literally, I sat there and I, 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 I hit my chair back and cause a contract. I, I throw my chair back, checking on Laura while she's uh, to give her the Heimlich. And um, she starts choking on something. But my chair goes back too far. And it hits another lady and it sets off a chain of events where it destroys the entire restaurant. Um, so okay. all of that took a lot of choreography throughout the week. Mm-hmm. And um, and that began a lot more choreography in episodes, subsequent episodes after that. Um, but mm-hmm. it was like, from that moment on, I started seeing things like a camera not getting to its mark on time. I started yeah. seeing, I see, right, right. So I start, I start, uh-huh. I start seeing. You get really you, acute. You, like you, you can like, especially as a child, you're milking so much yeah. and you're taking so much right? in. We know the inner workings of a set. Like the only people who I know how a set works this well are child actors, yeah. because we see right. everything. It's so heightened for us. You know what I'm saying? It was like, you know, in a in a um, in a dosi do in dosi do blocking, where basically you just pass each other for the express purpose of turning around again, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, I would notice that that the the camera had not gotten to its position yet, and so I would mm-hmm. I would even be like, okay, I got a hold for this lab, I got a hold for this lab. And I remember, I got a really cool compliment from one of my producers one time. He said, "You're a little scary, Jalil, as a kid, because we did a scene once, and you came up to me after we did the scene, and you said, can we do it again, Michael? Because you're not going to like it in the C camera.'" And and he said, I made it a point to go to editing that week and watch that scene. And I saw mm-hmm. that the camera had arrived late. And I was, he was like, that's when we knew all his producers that we could just give you stuff that we could give any adult. And it was we we talked about it all week. So, you know, those for me, at least professionally, though, Tyler, like mm-hmm. those are my Emmys. Because it means I saw yeah. I saw what I was supposed to see. You know what I'm saying? These things yeah. get, these, these things get dusty around the house. You know, my my lady yeah. to clean my crew. You know, they get dusty. Now, come on, let's keep it real. Let's get, they get dusty. <laughs> yeah, they do. They you do. Know, and, they and, do. And, the, and the number on it starts to fade. It's like, oh, 1993. I don't want to talk about nothing in the 90s. I don't even like, to, I don't even like discussing the 90s around women. I don't even like discussing that. That's a guarantee you ain't going to get no ass talking about the 90s too much around, <laughs> the, around the woman. You know what I'm saying? Talk about the 90s. You know I love the 90s. You know, Bell, Bill, Devoe, baby. It's like, why am I sitting here with this Negro? <laughs> 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 At least come up to Nelly. God damn. Just, you know, not... that, Jeez. <laughs> uh, question. Did you uh did you ever meet Bill Cosby though when you did uh the voice for uh for, for Bobby a little bit? Uh, you know what's interesting? I met Bill much later. Um I met Bill actually at the Image Awards. Well, okay. I had won, I had won R.I.P. Bernie Mac had just won. Um and Bill was back there um, and we ended up having a conversation somehow. I got pulled in by Bernie um, and then someone snapped a photo and there's a photo online of myself, Bernie Mac and Bill Cosby having a conversation. Oh, that's um, crazy. He didn't even know I had done, I had done um, little Bill oh, so he didn't um, know. at okay. the time. Okay. He had no idea. So I was like, this was, yeah, during Chris age, um, he had no idea. And it was kind of just, you know, it was surreal because Bernie, to me, 
it's it's really I hold like strange opinions. But <laughs> Bernie to me um, in Head of State, which was Chris Rock's movie that he had done right before we started Everybody Hates Chris, Already was the know. funniest part of that movie. Oh no, be, be, he was like the funniest one in there, and I'm like, yeah, I know I'm working for this other guy, he's my boss and shit. But like, you're the funniest thing <laughs> in that last project. Hey, you spitting um, it real? Bernie was in a zone, man. That's Bernie was Bernie was in a place that nobody else could reside in. He found a way to stay right there, and it was a pocket that like everybody knew was specifically Bernie since King of Comedy. Yep. Um, and. I said that he was like, thanks, young blood. I appreciate it. But you need to meet this man. And then he introduced me to Bill. And now in hindsight, yeah. you know, with everything, it's, like, <laughs> it's, it's a mess. It's a, <laughs> oh, it's a mess. It's a mess. Um, if I were to think, you know, one of us is going to be in prison at some point. <laughs> it definitely wouldn't have thought it was Bill. Um, definitely wouldn't have seen left that coming. Um, the hard left. Um, but there was this interesting thing of like, okay, so in the midst of that being what that is, there were three generations of black network comedy right standing together at one time and understanding how difficult that is um to be not just black on network tv at any of these times but unapologetically black on network tv at all of these times um because bernie was incredibly unapologetically black um so it's one of those things that like you know now it's bittersweet but I can appreciate that moment for what that moment was. I like that. For sure. I like that, though. No, it's, 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 actually, you said that very poignantly. Like, you put me on pause. Damn, <laughs> like you said that. Huh? Because, Absolutely. no, because we all get challenged <laughs> about Bill's legacy or lack thereof yeah. at this point. You know what I'm saying? And yeah. it's like, it's hard to talk about Bill because Bill did so much for African Americans in television and particularly in comedy in television. And yeah. he's a statue, essentially, that's being, you know, deservedly so, that's being taken yeah, down. No, but by, n- by no means is this any kind yeah. of, you know, Bill Cosby apology yeah. or being, you know, a Cosby apologist. Um, but it's one, you know, it's it's the, you either, you know, die the hero, or live long enough to see yourself become the villain. We we wouldn't have been able to be here if it wasn't for the work that he did. Done. To open that door, for sure. So in a professional aspect. Um, so much of us owe so much to that process and what happened there. Now, personally, hey, dog, you're going to have to ride in prison. On <laughs> um, like, hey, fam, you're going to have to do that because, woof. Um, you got to do that bid, dog. You got to do that bid. You got you to, know, you, you know, you have to answer for that. And that's, you know, that's that comes with the public responsibility and where we are right now as a culture, as a whole of saying, like, you know, it's not just... You can do great things for the community, but you still have to be a decent human being. Um, And that's where we are culturally. But to get to this point, you know what I mean? To where we can, you know, be in front of this camera on, you know, it's not, it's not niche television where we have now with these like streamers. That was network TV. You had to appeal to the masses. And if you didn't have the masses, you didn't survive. Um, And that, you know, was one of those first open doors for us. Yeah. We in the church of Tyler James right now, y'all. He drop, he dropping nuggets, <laughs> gems. His diamonds all over the floor. Pick him up. His diamonds. Oh, um, all right, now you know we gotta talk about the elephant in the room, the key and peel mm-hmm. video. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, so for those of you who are listening and you don't know, um, Key and Peel, Jordan Peel, famously did a sketch about my character's. Steve Urkel's impact on the writer's room (laughs) Mm -hmm. of Family Matters. And it is hysterical. There's so many views of it on YouTube. It's ridiculous. I had so many people send it to me. I was actually in Deer Valley skiing, had my helmet on and everything, goggles. I never answer my phone when I'm skiing. And randomly, I'm getting on the lift and I see a FaceTime come in. And now you know how FaceTime goes, though, is FaceTime, Mm -hmm. if you're you're famous, y'all, is something you completely effing avoid if it's from the wrong person. (laughs) Yes. Or it's something that you absolutely must pick up and answer if it's from the right person. 
because they have something mm-hmm. wonderful for you on the other side <laughs> of that FaceTime. <laughs> so if you, yeah, so right? True. Did I put them on game, right? So if you, that's so. So true. if you got a famous person, you got a famous person's phone number, and you hit them with the FaceTime. I hope you know your station in their life. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so in this particular case, I'm on. I'm getting on the ski lift, and uh, and I see my joint says King Batch. So. Mm. Batch is my boy Andrew Bachelor from Instagram, uh-huh. Vine Fame, the crazy followers. And I'm like, oh shoot, I'm trying to get my mittens off and everything. I'm like, what Batch got for me? You know, Batch got uh-huh. for me. And I hit the button and it's Batch and Jordan Peele. And this is before I get out or any of that stuff. And Batch really? is like, yo, yo, Jaleel, Jordan want to talk to you. And he's like, yo, this is really him. And then Jordan, Jordan is such a humble dude. Like he really is. And yeah, he, he is. people have he no really idea is. just how humble that cat is, man. And, uh, and he's like, look, at, he's wearing a helmet. Like he, he in the snow, he black and he's like, he in the snow. <laughs> and so we're having this just like, in the first 30 uh, seconds you just in shock and you Jordan Peele and you Jaleel White and you black and you in the snow, right? And we, so we do really? that for a second. And then he was like, hey man, did you really like the skit? I'm like, bruh, I'm a man of comedy first. I mm-hmm. like anything clever. I like anything spot on. <clears throat> and, mm-hmm. um, and I said, it was absolutely hysterical. Oh, man, are you kidding me? Oh, he good. was like, I would have got you to do it. I would have called you up. And I was like, it's OK. I'm happy you got Tyler. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but I loved it. I thought it was freaking hilarious. How good. did Jordan rope you into that thing, man? So uh, I, yeah, I got a call um, from my manager. They were like, hey, uh, Jordan and Keegan are looking for people who can do a decent um, Steve Urkel impression. <laughs> that was like, okay, <laughs> what's the context? Um, because one, I've always wanted to be, you know, incredibly respectful to those who've come before me, you know what I mean? In any way, shape or form. And I've been acutely aware that you are one of those people I appreciate um, you know. who allowed me to be in that space. Um, so my first question was, what's the angle here? <laughs> and... <laughs> When they pitched me the angle, I died laughing because one, it felt like it was such a tribute to you in a way of the sense of like, yeah, he did kind of just walk in there and it just became his show. (laughs) It did just like, I don't think people really understand how rare that is in Hollywood. (laughs) Just be like, you know what? Yeah, let's do this. (laughs) Let's just go with that. Um, So I was like, oh, this is, this is, this is, fantastic absolutely i'm down to do this um and i ended up working with peter atencio for it who ended up doing whiskey cavalier he was like our on-set you know director for that and that's kind of where we built a relationship there um but i was interested in it because it was like it was so interesting and you know how their minds were you know what i mean like jordan's not going to see anything from the regular angle he's not going to see anything the way anyone else sees it um and I thought it was such a like funny, like interesting bit to kind of play with. Um, and then it kind of challenged me in some ways to like see how close to it I could get. I still feel like I could have gotten better <laughs> with more time. Like, because you were so specific in that show. Like your movements, your behaviors, your 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 the choices that you would make physically were so specific. And I, we had to shoot it really quickly. I think I was like the day they called me. I ended up having to do it in like two or three days. Um, so it was like, I really, I wish I had more time to really get you like, get that character down. Um, but I got as close to it as I could. I would, <laughs> I would love you know, like an opportunity to get it better at some point, but that's always just me and everything I do. I think any actor uh, gets in their car at the end of a day of filming and goes over in their head what they could have done better. I mean, I did. Absolutely. I did. Um, I did a, a show recently on, on Netflix called Historical Roast. And uh, mm-hmm. I was asked to play Nelson Mandela. And, oh, and okay. it, it was it's the, the show is basically people from history roasting each other. So at a roast. Mm-hmm. So um it was the roast for um for Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks was there. <laughs> and, and and yeah, it's great. It's a great show a great with, Je- with Jeff. That's Rock. a great bit. That's a but great again, bit. I'm like, I'm like, you know, I, I I could tell you and I share that DNA where I'm like, yeah, when I was asked to do it. I'm on YouTube. I'm researching like yeah. every aspect of how Mandela moves, his hands, his yeah. lip motions, everything. 
and then got it to a point where I was actually happy with it, but I only had two days to prepare for it. So it was like, yeah. you know, again, you get the 48 hours thing. thing, you know what I'm saying? People don't understand how shady casting is. Wait a minute, here's the better part yeah. about it though. I get on the 101, I'm driving home, I get a call from Jeff Ross, and he's like, Joel, dog, that was so good. Can you come back and do Muhammad Ali tomorrow? <laughs> so, so I'm actually it doesn't work. Like so that, I'm, like, but, okay. I'm like, but because it's Jeff Ross and he's the roast master and you know it's Netflix or whatever. So I'm like, mm -hmm. I, 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 yeah, man, yeah. And it's like all of a sudden I don't have a life. I'm not going home to my daughter. I'm back on YouTube no, now no. trying to figure out how to give the best Muhammad Ali in 24 hours. Yeah. So when I look yeah. at that, actually, I'm actually more impressed with my Muhammad Ali than the than the, the Nelson Mandela because of the duress that I had to create Muhammad Ali under. And- uh, Sometimes that's what does it, it's the stress. It's the stress, yeah. exactly, it's, it's totally the stress. So anyway, I always wanted you to know on the side that I love the skit and, and then shout out to Good. Jordan Peele. Good, i Because that was my biggest concern. It was like, you know, I wanted to do, make sure it was respectfully done and that, you know, it, when you saw it, you would fuck with yeah. it. Like, you know what yeah. I mean, you would like yeah. it. Um, and that's, that's, that was, that's like the one thing I wanted to come out of that. So I'm happy that's the case. Hey folks, Jaleel here. This episode is sponsored by Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community where millions come together to take the next step in their creative journey with thousands of inspiring classes for creative and curious people on topics including illustration, design, photography, video, freelancing, and more. Now, when I learned about Skillshare, I knew I had to use it to step up my photography game. My girlfriend was always telling me that she hates my photos that I take of her on her iPhone. This is a huge conundrum for boyfriends everywhere. But I use Skillshare to learn a bit about photography, and now I'm the only one that can take her pictures. Skillshare offers membership and meaning. With so much to explore, real projects to create, and the support of fellow creatives, Skillshare empowers you to accomplish real growth. Explore your creativity at Skillshare.com forward slash ever. And the first 1,000 people to use our link will get a free trial of Skillshare premium membership. That's Skillshare.com forward slash ever. You, um, you grew up in, uh, in Yonkers, New York, though, dog. So, yeah. so you're not like a yeah. New Yorker, New Yorker. You ain't claiming the Bronx. You ain't claiming Brooklyn. You ain't claiming... <laughs> like, I'm like, it's okay. a Yonkers. So you got to explain this, bro. I'll explain Yonkers for those who don't understand um, the geography of New York. When your people are from the Bronx and they just get above the poverty line, <laughs> you go to Yonkers. <laughs> and that's where, that's, that's where I grew up. <laughs> right as we got above the poverty line, ah, we're moving up to Yonkers, which is literally like a block away. Um, they got the, so, yeah, they got the I song mean, wrong. my whole family's... Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's not... It's not the, e it's no, not the not east side. Yeah, move up to the east side. You move no, up no, to no, Yonkers no, no, no. first, no, no. then the east side. We go from the Bronx to Yonkers, and that was as far as we got. <laughs> we went from the South Bronx to Yonkers. Um, yeah, I was there. My father grew up in the South Bronx. My mother grew up in Queens. Um, then when I was, like, first born, we lived in the Bronx for a minute. And then, you know, we just got right to a slightly better school district. And it was like we just, like, shifted right over to Yonkers. Um, but I was there only until about you know, 12. And then I was out in LA. People forget that we didn't shoot, you know, Everybody Hates Chris in New York at all. Nope. We shot literally none of it. It was all at Paramount Studios in LA. Yep. You've seen that stoop thousands of times. You've seen that school thousands of times. If you really pay attention to what you watch, we shot that all out here. Um, so, you know, my identity as a New Yorker it's a little fragile right now because I've now officially spent more time in LA than I did in New York. So I have to move back just to level this out. I like <laughs> that. though. I, I that. like That's that. That's an ideal. Jerry Seinfeld said that though, dog, he said he was like, when he was done with shooting Seinfeld, he wanted to get right back to New York because he was just like, yeah. I always treated this like it was a gig. He said, I'm, I, I, yeah. I'm, I'm the people out here thought I had become an LA person. And he was like, no, nah, I'm a New Yorker. This is my gig. Yeah. My gig sent me here. Yeah. And I always kind of respected that out yeah. of him though. Um, when it came to your um, moving out to L.A., though, oh, I, I heard your dad was a cop. Yeah. Okay. So how did it affect your father's job that you were moving to L.A.? Significantly. Um, significantly. So, you know, with this game and how it works, nothing's guaranteed. You can go do a show. Yep. 
do 13 episodes, not get the back nine, and it's just over. Um, or you could do a season, and then that's it. It's over. Yeah. Um, so he was, I think he had like four or five years left until retirement at the time. Um, so he stayed. He stayed in New York and kind of bounced back and forth when he could uh, while we were working. Um, and that was, you know, it was a strain. It was difficult. That is, it that was, is huge, you know, bro. I'm saying, no, I'm that's hard. It's hard. Bro, I'm about to lay, I'm about to lay something on you again. Um, I almost got the Cosby show as a kid. Mm. Rudy, if you will notice that name is a boy's yeah. name. The network at the time that was run by Brandon Tartikoff, great Brandon Tartikoff, um, had decided that they wanted Bill to have a little boy. And, mm. um, at the last minute, Bill was able to get them to change it to being a little girl. So I was mm -hmm. actually there for network for the last reading. Our, wow. our, um, my manager, I mean, my, uh, my agent at the time, had basically told my mom, like, he got it. He got the job, but it's network. Mm -hmm. So they, you know, you, you got to go in for network. And then when we got there, yeah. a little girl showed up and we were like, wow. wait, but how is there a little girl here for Rudy? Like what? I don't, I don't get it. And, um, it was, you know, you know how they do you. They send you in and out, pair you up, do all that stuff. They do, they, they did it all day, and uh, obviously, in, in, in that situation, actually, they picked the kids right there in the room, Tyler. They picked us all in the rave. They picked them all oh. in the rave, but like they said, we'll take you, 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 and you, and the rest of you. Whoa! Thank you for coming out, and I was devastated. Wow! I'm not even lying. I went home as a kid. And I remember banging my head up against my my bunk bed. You know, I had a I had a kid's reaction to it. And my mom came yeah. and she grabbed me by the God. shoulders and she was like, "If you ever react like that to not getting a job," and I'm like, "Like, mom, why did they tell us right there? Why did they tell us right there? Why did they tell us right there?" And it was just like, I guess they were pressed for time or some kind of crap, and they needed to fly everybody to New York yes. immediately. But my parents were struggling with that because. Obviously, at the time, back then, it was the great Bill Cosby. Mm -hmm. And my father- At the time, at the let's time, be clear. Let's keep it, be clear. At the time, All right. context it, has it changed. changed. Right, so it was like, my yeah. dad was a, was a dentist. And it was like, Michael, oh, wow. what are we going to do? Like, are you going to, you know, can you apply for a license in New York? Uh, like, you know, what, what are we going to do? And it was like, they had already kind of come to the yeah. conclusion that it was like, Gail, you're going to go out there with him first. And, you know, mm -hmm. if it stays on the air, then I'll catch up. And so I knew mm -hmm. when I saw that your dad was a cop, I was like, oh, they yeah. they actually went, they lived the dynamic I almost lived. That was the whole point of that yeah. story. Cause I don't ever like Keisha to feel like that was my job, Keisha. That was my job. I don't ever like Keisha. Yeah. You know, Keisha and I pull you. But I'm like, I yeah. just there was something that was gonna happen to a family in that moment. And yeah. and you lived it. So I was like, Yeah, no, it did. It very well happened to us. And it was difficult because, you know. It, these things, they move so fast. Um, there's, I tell everybody getting into the industry, particularly with a child, you're not ready. There's no way to be, yeah. there's no way to be ready. There's just know that there's no way to get ready. It just is what it is. Um, and that was, you know, a difficult decision that we had to make. He was flying out to LA every two weeks. Um, it's just like, you know, worked it out with the job. The good thing is the show was so big in New York. I was on literally every bus in New York City. That was like UPN's promotional tool for it. Um, so the job knew. They were very aware of why he would have to come to LA. Um, he just worked out a schedule where every other week he could come out for like, he'll get like a Friday off and a Monday off. Right. And just stay there through the weekend and come and then go back and forth. Um, and we did that until he retired. And it worked out so that he retired in 2009, right as we finished the last season of That's Everybody Meets Chris. That's dope. Now, you also have three yeah. brothers. Um, yep. And that's Tyler, Terrell, and Tylan? Okay. Tyrell. Yeah, Tylan. Okay. It's, yeah, Tyler, Tyrell, and Tylan. Okay. That's, they, they, our parents really... You wanted to have fun with yeah, that. Yeah, y'all, yeah. <laughs> okay, y'all fertile with the T's. Fertile with the T's. There it is. I thought th I there thought 3T was a singing group. It's your family. I thought 3T was yeah, a it's just our family. That's it. That's just us. Um, That's it. <laughs> how did it affect your siblings' lives? You moving out there though. Moving to LA. Um, so my baby brother's never been in a brick and mortar school. You know what I mean? You know how this goes yeah. when we get on set, we have to start being homeschooled. Right. So my mother had 
three boys. And she was like, well, might as well do all of them. Wow. Um, so the baby boy never actually went to a brick school. He's not, he just turned 18 this past December. Um, but what happened was they started working. So we had all been like doing commercials and things like that in New York. Um, but what's actually really interesting is we all got our own shows at 12. That's dope. <laughs> it was really, it, our agents were, of course, ecstatic. <laughs> so you were like the acting ball brothers. You were like the acting. Kind of, I mean, kind of. Um, so yeah, by the time, <clears throat> we're all four years apart. Um, by the time my middle brother turned 12, he got what ended up being called Lab Rats. It was eventually, it was originally Billion Dollar Freshman when he shot the pilot. It became Lab Rats. He did that for four years. My baby brother then jumped on a show with Tia Mowry um, called Instant Mom when he turned 12. Um, so we kind of all stepped into it. Now, as adults, we're kind of exploring what mediums we prefer more than others. Um, because, you know, you have more options as an adult and we're all doing like my brother, my middle brother's doing music now really well. And it's, it's coming together. Uh, the baby boys writing a bunch of stuff. Um, so we just all fell into the industry one by one and found that we had a knack for it. Um, did you, did you have anybody else in the family? That's no, in the man, I'm very much an only child, man. I'm an only child in my really? behaviors. I'm an only child in actuality. <laughs> I'm an only, I am only, <laughs> I am, I'm alone on this bitch, brother. Like if it, yeah. I am on this raft by myself. I have my mother and my father. And when they leave, it's so me. So how was, was, was that just you? Um, like usually from what I've found and like I've heard from other child actors, they knew somebody in the industry and that's how it got started. So my story was interesting in that my preschool teacher, I went to a great hood preschool that was run by an Asian mm -hmm. family. All right. So this Asian family used to serve up the real hot noodles for the black kids. And uh, and the the lady uh, Eva Lou who owned the spot, she uh, she went to my mom and she said Jalil is really funny, and I was only age three, and she was like he needs to be doing mm. commercials like that Rodney Allen Rippy. Now you can go Google that Negro, you mm. don't even know who the hell he is. Yes, he did a Burger King no, commercial I, with a big ass afro, I do. right? And so she's like he needs to be doing. I had an afro like that. She said he needs to be doing commercials just like that, and she didn't know anybody. So she found an acting school. She literally just tore an acting school out the newspaper and was like, you should take him here. And so my mom, again, wow. just being a, you know, a hustler and as a black woman, just kind of like, mm -hmm. okay, I'll explore this, took me to an acting school that was really nothing more than a scam that was operating like a baby, uh, uh, a not babysitting, but like There's a daycare. There's so right? many of It was those. a daycare. It was a daycare. So you know, many. Okay, pile yeah. of kids in here. We're not really teaching them anything, but hey, make sure you give them $5 for the vending machine. So that's what that, that was the business model back there, right? But a woman came along who ultimately became the biggest talent agent for kids in Hollywood. And out of mm. all the kids picking us out like a litter, like literally a litter, that one with the big Afro, I'm gonna take a chance on him, I want him. And she started repping wow. me and her name was Iris Burton. And she repped Kirk Cameron, Fred Savage, yeah. the Olsen twins in the beginning, Kirsten Dunst, uh, Henry Elliott from E.T. She had everyone. She was the number one. She became the number one child agent yeah. there was. Um, and even that, there's a whole context. We could talk about agents and whatnot, but that's how yeah, I yeah. got in the business. And I started booking jobs because my mom took immaculate care of me. Even though my mother yeah. grew up in the Crenshaw district out here, she was mm -hmm. a very meticulous woman. She was an extremely hygienic woman. I think that matters. Mm -hmm. And when I say that, I say mm -hmm. that because I was a three-year-old kid that had a perfectly quaffed afro, clean mm -hmm. fingernails. I was polite. That's a big part of I, it. I, I, yep. I spoke well. And then I remember I went even for the audition for the, the Toys R Us commercial. I don't remember it, but my mom tells me, she was like, when you walked in, they said, oh, he can't, he's too little. And they were like, why? It's because you have to be able to read the cue cards and, and sing the song. So he's too little. Mm -hmm. And she said, no, he reads. And, and so they took me over to the cue cards. And it was like, I don't want to grow up. I'm a Toys R Us kid. And I'm like, I was like three turning four. And my mom said, in that job, Iris practically booked me in the job before I even left the dawn. Then they were like, hey, we got a little black kid with a perfect head who can read. He got to get, get, mm -hmm. give him the check, <laughs> check. Yeah. So um, that's where I, that's my whole, th those are my origins and what I owe it to. Mm -hmm. And it sounds kind of similar to you in that it was just kind of like, you know, don't ever 
discount that we are on God's plan. And, and, mm -hmm. and, it, and it's not all that. Now I think it's different. People get into the business because there's a lot more um, deliberate decision making of I'm trying to become a star. I'm trying to become, I want a TV yeah. show. And back then it didn't go like that. It was like, you either kind of had a no. light about you. And I feel like even yourself, you know, that I'm curious, even like, how much was Chris Rock even involved in picking you? Well, it, interestingly enough, um, Rock had reservations about me. And that's like the notorious yep. thing. Um, he had reservations because, it, and I quote, the kid's too cute. I wasn't that cute. <laughs> <laughs> when he was, that's lit. That's what he was like, oh. So all he right, knew he was cool. ugly. Okay, all right, go. <laughs> he, said, he said it. I was like, hey, dog, that's you, not me. I'm not going to speak on it, but it's happy that we're addressing this. Uh, <laughs> uh, but it actually came down from um, Ali and um, Leslie Moonves, hey. who was another one who's been ousted at CBS. Yep. And now, so I, it's, hey, that was my that boss, was too. another... So you yeah, don't even know yeah, that. Less. Leslie Moonves ran Laura Mark Television, which became which was uh, became Warner Brothers uh, or merged yeah. with Warner Brothers. And uh, Leslie used to take me to, you know, he took me to my first Laker game courtside. Um, really? I, I would go to Leslie's house for Christmas parties. Um, I during my contract negotiations, Leslie would have invite me to lunch at the uh, Warner Brothers commissary, and I would ask wow. directly about my money. Et cetera, et cetera. Wow. And I remember, and Leslie was a tough dude. I mean, Leslie was like yeah, Leslie was yeah. like a mafia don. And Leslie literally, yeah. he would he would put his tablecloth over his over his lap, and, and you have lunch, and he'd be like, "All right, so I heard you have some issues with your contract." And I'm like, um, "I'm like, dang, I don't want to say nothing crazy to do. I really like going to the Laker game." You see what I'm saying? Like, we're not even yeah. <laughs> as kids, we're overwhelmed by this. And I was just like, you yeah. know what I told him? I'll never forget it. I told him, I said, "You gonna love this one. You gonna bust up on this one." I said. This is me and Leslie Moonves at the Warner Brothers commissary. And probably, I'm probably about 14, 15 years old. And I said, um, Leslie, look, I don't know what's going on with this contract. I just know my mom's on the phone all the time and she's talking to the agents. And, and then, you know, sometimes she's like not really happy or whatever with, with, you know, when she gets off the phone. But whenever I have to fly to New York for upfronts and stuff, like I got to fly first class, Les. Because when I fly coach, like they asked me a lot of questions and they treat me different back there. So I looked on the ticket and the first class ticket is like $2,000. So I need a lot of $2,000. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is me negotiating my contract. I need a, uh, I need a lot of $2,000 so that I can always <laughs> stay in first class. Because they're not nice to me. Like, they like me if I'm in first class, but then if I go back to coach, all of a sudden, everybody on the plane don't like me no more. <laughs> I need a lot of $2,000. I need a lot of $2,000. $2, and so he's like... That's a starting right. point in negotiations. So he was like, don't worry, Jaleel, you're going to fly first class for a very long time. <laughs> there we and go. And I have to admit, he did make that happen. He did make that happen. Yeah. He did make that happen. Yeah. No, I mean, yes, he was the one who really... To Les and Don Ostroff, who was the head of um, UPN at the time, saw what that show could be when a lot of people didn't. Um, because our numbers, people don't realize, season two through four were awful. They were, like, really bad. Um, and now people would kill for those kind of numbers. But at the time, we were barely hanging in there. Um, but they saw when putting it on a bigger platform and syndicating it heavily. Hey what the possibilities were. Um, and from what I understand, it was his call on my, um, on my casting. Um, he was like, Oh, it was his call. I can, I can tell you 100%. It was his it call. Was, yeah. That's it's, there's been like some conversation and dispute around nah. it. You know, Ali's always Take said it from your that. Boy. he's like, no, we were always, I was like, eh, that it was left. <laughs> yeah. Don't ever, don't ever let it anybody snow you on that. I know how he gets down and that was less. Yeah. That was less. Um, and that's how, you know, that happened. Chris was actually, you know, he was doing a lot at the time. He wasn't around as frequently or as part of the process as people would like to believe. Most of that. I believe you. Was Ali. Yep. That was Ali. Yep. Ali carried the majority of that show. Um, so that's who I worked, you know, the most intimately with and learned how to be a number one 
that's you know that's what's really hard about that is at some point you become the number one of a show and you're 13. Now, um, you know what's interesting? Let's, I want to put that in context for people when you say the number one, because the people who don't mm -hmm. get it, that means number one on the call sheet. All right. Yeah. So the call sheet is a big deal. The call sheet is what goes out to the cast and crew every day to let mm -hmm. everybody know their call time the next day. And number one on the call sheet is a status symbol. It's a status symbol that I didn't yeah. completely understand at all when I was a kid. And, and let me tell yeah. you something. I was never number one on the call sheet. We never asked that mm. it was changed. Uh, I was probably yeah. eight or nine or something like that. And it stayed that way for all nine seasons. Um, yeah, it just, it stays. Yeah, it, it stays. So, but unfortunately, because it stays, it does affect certain people's egos. And, mm -hmm. and certain people resent the fact that they're not number one on the call sheet, particularly if they're adults. Mm -hmm. Or in reverse, they are number one on the call sheet, but they're not necessarily being treated like they're number one on the call sheet. So. These little, you know, that's, that's, that. We had a really interesting conversation about that. So when we started, Chris, um, I was number three. Ooh. Right. I was number three. Um, and I, the same thing. I didn't know what that you meant. You didn't know? I know you didn't. <laughs> you didn't know. I have no idea what this is about. Um, Ali had a conversation with me one day that was really poignant. He was like, listen we need you to carry this. And that's what this is. Um, he tried to explain that to me um, by way of like the hierarchy and all of that works. And I, I didn't really get it at the time. It was like, okay, yeah, whatever. Um, but I now understand what that conversation was and how I answered it properly at the time without knowing it. Tashina was our number yeah. one. And I had said at the time, I was like, yeah, well, she's, the only one of us who's like had a show be this successful before. So I think she should be the one who like people can get behind her. She felt like a good leader for mm -hmm. us. Um, so for me, I, I've had that happen multiple times. I could give two shits about where I land on the call sheet number. My job is to carry this. If it's my job to carry this or to support whoever I'm supposed to support when I do. Um, it is a big status symbol, but ultimately it's bullshit. It just really is. Um, Tashina was the leader that we needed for that show. Um, but the conversation was ultimately, she's going to be number one, but you need to handle this and carry it like a number one. And that's what was beautiful. about. It's it. very interesting though, because, um, being the number one on a show comes with a tremendous responsibility. Not everybody mm -hmm. handles that responsibility, um, with grace, let alone no. with humility. Um, no. um, I've had some awful yeah, number ones. They, we, we get to that. We get to that. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, yeah. as a kid, um, on top of needing uh, a, a grace and humility, though, you, you get, you're a kid. You're a freaking kid. And you're in this almost power struggle with somebody that you know you need to defer to because, and it's set up that way. You know what I'm saying? I can hear that you respect Tashina as a, as, as a performer and as a beast, that she is. But it's like, they almost pit you against each other. You know, and I, I know that happened to me even with Reginald Vell Johnson a lot, where it was just kind of like, you know, we had some really tense moments where it was, I was pit against this grown man for who's running things around here, who's mm -hmm. getting the biggest laughs, yeah. who's got the biggest dressing room, who's got the closest parking spot, who's number one on the call yeah. sheet, who's determining the food for the cast on show night, who, it, it, you know, mm -hmm. who gets more seats, dog, who gets more seats? Or it's tape night, yeah. like the pettiest of petty stuff. And it's like every week it was another thing. And you're a kid and you're just like, I just want to have fun and make everybody laugh. And that's literally yeah. the way you're thinking. So to emerge from that with your faculties, man, to emerge from that hmm. and not be, you know, it didn't go to your, it go to your head. It, it, it doesn't get crazy. No. I had, a, I worked with a, um, with a showrunner who worked with Frankie Muniz on on, uh, mm -hmm. on Malcolm in the Middle. Uh, Malcolm, and yeah. uh, we were shooting hoops on a little portable basket gun. And he started talking about Frankie or whatever. And he says, oh, I used, this kind of reminds me when I, you know, I'm a grown man at this point, but he was like, you know, it kind of reminds me when I used to uh, play basketball with Frankie Muniz and let him win. And uh, and I was like, wait a minute, hold on, hold on. What are we, you, 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 as you recall that, the thing you recall the most is that you would let him win. He was like, he was my boss. I'm not going to beat my boss. 
And it's like, wow. So put that in context of how that had to have affected Frankie's upbringing, that he had all these adults around him who are catering to him, catering to him. Maybe if he's saying things inappropriate or appropriate. Either way, everybody's handling him with kid gloves because it's like, technically, homie, you my boss, and I can't have you upset with me or seeing me differently. So all to, to live those dynamics, man, um, yeah, if, 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 I'm hearing it. You, just, you it, went through it. it. You, yeah. you went through it. Oh, no, no. There was the, the amount of, you know, of BS that happens behind a set. Uh, people will never understand. Um, but I think it's a real tribute to T. Uh, to Sheena, there's a picture in, from season one where I'm laying my head on her shoulder. And it was in between takes and stuff like that. And I'm almost falling asleep because we were a single cam. We yep. shot all day, all the time. That It doesn't stop. Uh, nine and a half hours up until a social worker has to say he has yeah, to go Yeah, okay, so wait, did you... Because I hold was Hold up, in, I gotta ask you a question. Did your social worker was she, say, like, were they lenient or were they strict? So they... It was lenient at the beginning until um, I got the flu every year because I was overworked. I was in 27 pages out of 30. And we had to somehow find a way to shoot that nine and a half hours a day. Um, in season two and three, we got a 44 episode pickup because we were growing. So they were leading at first because we had to somehow find a way to find our equilibrium and get this show done with a kid lead who could only shoot maximum 10 hours. Um, but over time, they were like, we're going to burn him out. <laughs> like, we're just going to yep. burn him out. It's not going to like he's not going to be here. There's not going to be a show. Um, and actually, who made that call and was like the most vocal about it initially was Tashina. She saw her number one position with these kids as these were her children. That's so beautiful. She had just had Elijah, yeah. um, her daughter at the time. And that's what stopped that, like, from being an actual power struggle. She became our professional mother. She, like, protected us. And I remember one time when, you know, of course, with producers, they don't want to spend money on whatever, whatever we were talking about at the time. I think it was, like, food for our schoolroom or something like that. Tashina called SAG herself. Oh, 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 oh. It's, it's real now. <laughs> Tashina called SAG and said, y'all need to come fight for these kids. <laughs> and like, that's the difference in that show. Now, I thought that was the way it was everywhere. I went and did other shows. and was like, oh, no, no, this is terrible. Like so many times you're just the worst. Um, and they run with that because that's the thing. It's enabled. It's very much so enabled. And when you when that happens to you from a child, and I'm happy that wasn't the case with me, how else are you supposed to know that it's supposed to be different or you're supposed to be humble or just do the work? And people just think this comes with it. It's the old, it's the ultimate example of privilege. And it's not until you go elsewhere and you realize how other things work that you really see that. And I've seen that happen to people before, particularly kids yep. um, who just can't take it, who can't take the way you now have to hustle after that show. Yep. Whatever that was for you. Yep. Um, and that's unfortunate. It's something we really have to change in this, you know, like you were saying, handling with gloves. Like, no. Well, you 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 touched on it when you talked about the Stranger Kids things. You know, I consider that the first generation of child actors whose metrics in social media will now dictate that they be dealt with like adults. Yes. Be and, and that's a huge change for us. See, if, if Everybody Hates Chris had run in the Instagram era, You'd have this following that would appeal to yeah. brands and networks and studios far beyond your ability. That. They don't care whether you can act yeah. or not. Oh, this Negro got 10 million followers. Uh, so he's in consideration. And then at that point, if you give them a level of professionalism and accountability or whatever that they deem is, you know, what you know is suitable, you get hired. Mm -hmm. Um, so the the Stranger Kids things, I I really again, that's those incremental steps that we have to celebrate for others, you know, are yeah. You know, they're going to benefit from that. But we didn't have that um, back no. in the day. We had no way to control our we had, narrative. We had no way to control um, at all. And people think that we had more control than we had being number yeah. one. In, OK, so let me put people on game a little bit just about show business and kids. Mm -hmm. And these are two generalizations I know you're going to agree with me on. Your show is only as big as your biggest star. And ultimately. You're going to go as your producers and directors go. So you are who mm -hmm. you work for. If I if yes. I start in an action movie that was produced by Jerry Bruckheimer, 
and that movie made $100 million at the box office, I don't even have to be number one or number two on that call sheet. If that movie made $100 million in the box office, I am now in consideration for anything action related in the town yeah. because I worked with Jerry Bruckheimer. So yeah. when you consider who we worked for, and now he's even telling us, Tyler's even telling us right now, it's like, yeah, the show was based on Chris Rock, but I didn't really work with Chris Rock very much. You mm -hmm. know, the man that I worked for very specifically was Leslie Moonves. And if the way to have a career is you need many Leslie Moonveses in your life. Yes. And if you have three and four and five less Leslie Moonveses in your life back then, then you were going to have a more well-rounded career. So I always tell people, I had a job, y'all. And I had a job that I worked to the bone. And then I became a young man. And all of a sudden, I had a business that says, if you want a career, you're going to start right here. So let's, mm -hmm. let's pick up on that with how did it affect you as a young man auditioning while famous? Because obviously, I was really happy to see you in The Walking Dead. Yeah. But after the actor, mm -hmm. I was like, oh, no, he auditioned for that. So... What you just explained was my career strategy after Everybody Hates Chris. Um, we came out of that. I was 17 and felt like I had hit a wall. And I was like, hey, y'all. So I would like to do this for the rest of my life. <laughs> um, we're going to have to do a big narrative recraft because of how big this show had become and polarized this character had been. Um, and when I sat down with my agents and managers, that was the plan. The plan was we're going to act as if none of that ever happened. Right. We're going to go back out and beat the block as if there's nothing on the slate. We've And essentially, we said everything I get offered, we're going to turn down. We're going to go fight for everything. And if we like, because, you know, the thing after you come off a show yeah. like that, you get offered things that are the same thing. Oh, yeah. Right. And I was like, we have to get more diverse. Um, and then that became the conversation, which was I want to work with all of the best directors in the next, I think that was like a 10 year plan. And when they're trying to put together a cast that they want to win awards, that I get a phone call. Um, and that, that was just, I got hungrier than I'd ever been before. Um, the Walking Dead definitely went in there and I fought for that. Um, Dear White People fought for that too. Um, Detroit worked with Catherine Bigelow, fought for that. Um, more recently, the last movie I just did was the U.S. versus Billy Holiday with um, Lee Daniels. Um, fought for that. I got two scenes and in Dream just, Girls. It got cut down to one. I fought for that. <laughs> and that's the thing. You just you thank have you, to Bill go Condon. Fight for thank it. you, Mr. Bill Condon. You know what I mean? And that's the thing. You have to put your ego to the side yeah. and whatever you're used to. Um, get hungrier than you've ever been in your life, and go fight for it. Um, so. What you have to do, I feel like, and what I had to learn how to do was to shut out everybody else. Um, because when auditioning while famous, every like the sitting in the auditioning room dynamic is something that doesn't get talked about a lot. Where you're sitting there with other guys who look pretty much like you, who you know are going to give decent reads just like you are. Um, and they're asking you, why are you here? You know what I mean? Like, dude, why are you? You've already done this. I've been like, asked yeah, the same words word for word why are you why are here? you here <laughs> and it's like i'm here for the job <laughs> same reason why you're here <laughs> uh, but there's this like thing and like understanding of like oh no once you did that you'll never have to fight for anything again i'm like no that's when you have to fight your hardest you have to come out here and fight your hardest after that now let's define um, let's, so de was, let's define fight though define fight for people so they could so, so this is not coming forward from a an angry, angry place. What? Oh, no, 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 no. It's definitely not. I like, know that. I, I know that, but I'm talking about people that don't, they, they're like, why do these dudes keep talking about fighting for roles? They, what, they, what, they, do they, is it a yeah. fight club situation? Do they, do they put them in a room and it's whoever comes Actually, out? <laughs> I wish <laughs> that would make it much more simple. It really would. I ain't mad at you, dog. Um, no, by fight for it, it means 
you have to put your ego to the side completely. Yeah. I think a lot of people think that you just get like offered movies. And the funniest thing is when you see a headline of so-and-so joins the cast of. <laughs> the joining yep. of the cast is they read six or seven yep. times for a bunch of yeah. different people. They then negotiated and they said, okay, cool. Now you can join us. It's not like that quick of a conversation. Oh, you only um, a celebrity so after forward, they hire you. <laughs> after they yeah. hire you. That's it. Um, and fighting for it means going back to casting, going back to every casting agency and head that you know, and reading for things that are going to change the conversation for you and that are going to be difficult and stretch you. And so really the fight is with yourself. Yep. Ooh. The fight's <sighs> with you. That's really what it is. You're fighting you. You're fighting what you've previously done. You're fighting what, you know, where you want to go and the obstacles that are in front of you. I don't ever like to think of like competing with other people in the Man, room that's so because healthy. I think every actor in that room so is has a shot at this. And if you want my take on this, you want mine and you want nobody else's. But if you want someone else's, I was never going to give that to you. Um, but that's what it is. You're fighting all of the 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 bullshit, the ego, the what we were talking about, that being number one. Yeah, all it's of all that. Gone you gotta now. fight that. It's As gone. a young adult you shows over. over, you're starting over from scratch. You're starting over and listen, you're starting from scratch. We, we're living in a different era now where you can say it. Um, I think mm -hmm. every child actor is forced to go through this. Um yeah. white or black. But the reality of it is it's even tougher for an African American. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, the number, Without a shadow. Without you know, we, you and I, um, you know, knock on wood, if there's someone else that I'm out that I'm forgetting, we're probably the only people over a certain height that have even survived mm -hmm. <laughs> what it is, yeah. that journey is, because yeah. there was a, you know, with, with Gary and Emmanuel, there was a diminutive yeah. thing that was trending that even got them hired back yeah. then. Um, so, you know, there was, we're the first generation of, well, I guess they can grow up and become adult actors and performers yeah. as well. But you have to hold their hand through that conversation. Yeah, you do. Is the thing. You have to think, and you, I love that you said you like these like kind of smaller steps. And that was the idea, was that we knew we couldn't change the conversation immediately. That it took little step after little step after little step and like the gigs had to reflect the change and showing people who you can be and act as as an adult you have to reveal that to people and give them time to see that so it's not going to happen quickly um but you know did the majority of the roles i ended up doing in the beginning after chris were they all written white and we had to flip them to black yeah that's what it's going to take you're going to have to be able to go into a room and flip everything that they thought they could do because they weren't looking to hire a young black kid who had previously been on a show for however nope. long, you know what I mean? And could possibly get stuck in that. Um, and that's, that's what that really was about for me specifically um, was changing that conversation little by little by little, knowing that it was built against me to do. Whew. You can't go into it not knowing that people aren't going to want to see it particularly from like black sitcoms or black comedies. They're not going to want to see it. This episode is brought to you by Magic Spoon. I love this. You guys, when I was a kid, my mom would never let me have sugary cereals. All the stuff with tigers on them and dragons and chocolate looking Dracula people. I was never allowed to touch any of those cereals as a kid. Now I'm a grown man, real grown man, and I need to watch my waistline, but I still like sugary cereals. So guess what we have now? We have Magic Spoon, all the flavor and none of the junk, zero sugar, 11 grams of protein, and only three net grams of carbs in each serving. Come on, four flavors, cocoa, fruity, frosted, and blueberry. I'm partial to blueberry and frosted. Those are my favorites. Go to magicspoon.com forward slash ever to grab a variety pack and try it today. And be sure to use the promo code ever at checkout to get that free shipping. And Magic Spoon is so confident in their product that it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it, they will refund your money, no questions asked. That's magicspoon.com slash ever and use the code ever for free shipping. We thank Magic Spoon for sponsoring the podcast. Give me, and you can drop the name if you want to or not, because I got a great William Shatner story that I've shared 
Um, but I already shared it. But give me a number one actor who did not act properly at all. Just a story, a context of what happened. Or, or I can flip, or I can give you this. Um, mm -hmm. Give me a scenario where you had to show up on somebody else's set and it felt like from the actors to the producers to everyone, they almost went out of your, out of their way to make you feel like you were a novice and you had never done this before. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, so the second one, it's more than, it's definitely more than one. <laughs> it's so many of them. Um, let me think. What, what, what was like... Okay, so I won't name, but you may be able to put some pieces together. All right, all right, all right. Let's keep it <laughs> you safe. You may be able to figure it out. Um, I I did a show um, that was an ensemble, and it was my first comedy back after Everybody Hates Chris because after Chris, I pretty much made a rule for you know my work that was wasn't going to do a comedy for a while. Right. Um, it was like the first comedy back, and. The show had a huge cast. It was a lot of people um, in their defense. However, they definitely would lean on others more than they would the others. Um, and some of us had carried shows before and others had not. However, there was a, a, a dismissiveness. And that was the only time I had been confronted with the phrase of you should be happy to be here. Yep. And love the show, love the people, all of that. But that was what one time it changed my career and I drew a line in the sand and I said, I'd rather not have a job than to be, than to be undervalued and be told I'm happy that I should be happy to yeah. be here. And to be treated like that. I do. And it, when that show got canceled, I was like, oh, thank God. Okay, bye. And, just like, yeah. and that was it. And that that was just, that was my line. That was the line of like, you have to be able to check your ego, yeah. but then you have to know the value of your worth as yeah. well. Yeah, yeah. You have to know both of those conversations um, so that we I could get to a place where I had, you know, a very good experience like Whiskey Cavalier with working with Peter Atencio and Bill Lawrence where that was never in question. And that's the thing, like there's is this understanding of some, with every industry, there are gonna be those who are on an ego trip and that's just what it is. I refuse to work for those people anymore. One of the best, the career changing conversation for me was The Walking Dead. To have a almost angelic number one, like Andrew Lincoln. Like he's almost angelic. That's awesome. Really. Like he's he's the best number one I, I've ever worked with ever. Like, and I've worked with some really great people. And he's all about just doing the work. And then that producing team, I came in in season five when the show was like at its peak. It was a hit already. You know, it wasn't like I came in in the beginning and we were rising. Right, right. I came in at its peak, so I expected to get disrespected when I showed up. I expected it, but was actually the most embraced. The most embraced, the most valued, the most welcomed to be there and i think that's kind of it it doesn't have you don't have to be a dick is what i tell people all the time in the industry you don't have to you just really don't have to we there's a way to get this done without that um, i had that experience with hugh laurie on um on house he was a same so did i with hugh on house he was amazing number one i mean did, 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 did you one. see the grass in front of his his uh his yes. Ass? Did he has real grass people had, my man had real grass like he had, a, he had to build an actual porch and real grass in front of his dressing room. <laughs> wow. Like he was, he, he was just the best. And it's like, yeah, but what I, the thing I found that like, you can always tell is it's always the most insecure. Yep. It's always an insecurity issue without a shadow of a doubt. We saw that recently with, um, with Glee. Also, rest in peace, Naya Rivera, 2020 is ass. Yes. Yes. Um, but, um, where one of the actors was calling out um, Leia Michelle yeah. as a number one. Right. And it's like, yeah, it's always coming from insecurity. You don't have to do this. You're never as big as you think you are. You are the king of this castle. There's a lot of castles. Um, and that's, we're seeing, you know, more and more actors kind of speak to that. 
Um, for me personally, I make the choice to, oh, once you let me know who you are, it's fine. I don't need to speak on it. You'll just never see my face ever again. Yeah. Um, and you can't buy it. You just, you just can't buy me. I don't care what the project is. It's not worth the money if I have to deal with this. Um, but I think we're going to see that change more and more as more people start to speak because it happens oh, yeah. way more frequently than you would like to believe. A lot of people on your favorite shows, the leads are the worst. <laughs> They're the worst people. They really are. Which, but you know what? Which is which is why, again, it takes us back to this thing called social media. And we'll get, we'll, we'll get yeah. into that a little bit. Um, because back in the day, social media wasn't available as a medium for actors no. to grouse about legitimate mistreatment on a set. Yeah. And even Leah Michelle, listen, I don't know her. I don't need to attack. I don't either. I don't need to attack. I don't, I don't need to, to attack the girl, but there is, there is a, a through line in social media that says, oh, she was a bitch. Like mm -hmm. just act an actor that can be perceive what the other actors are communicating. Um, when mm -hmm. one actor rises up and all of a sudden three and four and five. And, but the thing was back then it was accepted that, well, yeah. she's the star and you know, and so it's okay. She can act this way and behave this way. And there's so many more people that are like that. And so now you have to do the issue, the apology, you know, I'm, I'm doing my inner work and all that crap. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's where we are, but really it's just social media. If social media didn't allow yeah. for complete strangers from worldwide to know, to have this collective discussion that somebody wasn't cool mm -hmm. on a set, like, and I don't mean cool, yeah. like, I mean, people going out of their way. Way to disrespect like, you. Like, um, yeah. you're in my chair right now, and they called me yeah. to hair. Why do you even need hair? Do you see what they're working with here? Like, like, like arrogant stuff like Yo, that. Like, you gotta be kidding me. <laughs> it's ridiculous. It's the I've had situations where people did their coverage and then just oh, left. jetted you, jetted you. Yes. Oh, so you gotta explain that. Like, gotta explain to people what okay. coverage is. So, so they get it. They won't get it. Coverage. <laughs> when you're shooting a multicam comedy, um, it's a little different when you're shooting a single. With a multi, the cameras move. As the scene moves with a single, you have to set up shots each like time. Like you make a movie. So you can have anywhere from like four to, depending on the director and, you know, how it's <laughs> they want to get to like 10 to 15 <laughs> shots per scene. Coverage is when two actors are talking, one will be covered on camera and the other one will be off camera. It is a, it is a Hollywood and actor, just basic common courtesy that although you're not on camera, you give the dialogue and the best performance you can to the person who's on camera so that they can do their best work and then they reciprocate for you. The amount of number ones who do only their side and then just literally leave and have one of the writers read the lines <laughs> to you on your side is ridiculous. <laughs> I've had that happen at least four or five different <gasps> times. And I'm like, Re okay, so we're just not going to, I've got to do this by myself. Cool. Doug, there's a certain the energy that's The first time it happens there. to you, though, you so hit, you so dumb with it because you can tell. And I was so confused. Yeah, you confused. You... I didn't know you could do that. I was shocked. <laughs> so... I didn't even know that was an option. <laughs> it's like, you not, an option not, not an option for your black ass. It's not an option for your. No, it's definitely not an option for me. I know that much right now. Um, but like that happens all of the time. Yeah. Um, and I think ultimately, it, it for me, it travels back to I don't think y'all like acting. I just I sit there like every time I say I don't think you like doing this. There's some people that don't, man. I you have like a great I have a great story. I did a pilot with um for ABC uh in the early 2000s and I was working opposite the great Frank Langella. Now, even as I oh, share yeah. even as I share this story, I was playing an assistant bellman to his bellman. It was the first drama mm -hmm. I had done for television post Family Matters. So, okay. I felt a pressure when I got onto the set that I need to be on my P's and Q's because I'm the yep. I'm the I'm the sitcom guy and suddenly I'm surrounded yep. by all these dramatic actors. Which is a which whole, is a whole nother stigma, other thing. Yeah. And so Frank, um Frank was a diva and a half. And I say that with respect because I ultimately figured Frank out. And Frank, I had the best time with Frank, but Frank definitely went through a process of making sure I knew my place before we could yeah. get to the place of getting along wonderfully. Okay, so I remember I showed up on the set and 
I had uh, wardrobe had given me a parka because we were shooting in the cold. Mm -hmm. And I had a red parka with a fur coat. And so she, Frank was going to come over and, and say hi to me. And uh, well, actually, one wardrobe wanted me to introduce me to Frank because we were in the vicinity of each other. She said, oh, you haven't met your co-star yet. Oh. And so Frank looked at me and he goes, and he feels my, uh, feels my, my, my collar, my fur collar. He says, I love your coat. It's lovely. And that was pretty much the high that I got. And he was like, oh, okay, what's up, dog? And, and so then I kept talking with the wardrobe lady as we left. And she was like, I think Frank's going to want your coat. And I was like, yeah, you got that feeling too? <laughs> right? And we just, wow. and she and I laughed at it. And I got to my trailer the next day. And I had a dusty black parka and not the red parka with the fur collar that I was wearing. And I go, I report to set. And sure enough, Frank Langella comes walking up to me in the red parka with the fur collar. And he comes right up to me, no hesitation. And he just rubs the collar this way he rubbed it when I was wearing. He was like, do you like my coat? Wow. And, I, and, and you know what I did? Because I dealt with Reginald Bell Johnson my entire life. I said, Frank, red's a good color on you. And the second I said that, he looked at me like, this little Negro is my new best friend. <laughs> uh -huh. And I'm telling you, dog, it was hysterical. And after that, it was like, Jalil, if you need to use my car, you can take it. I remember wanting to go to Niagara Falls. He was sending drivers uh -huh. out to get food for me and everything. But it was like, he was a seasoned actor. He's a great actor. He's an amazing mm -hmm. actor. I take nothing yeah, away from no, him. Amazing but actor. he amazing checked actor. me like, hey, I got a lot of scenes with you, young man. And this is the way it's going to go. So then the next thing that happened was Frank Langella, I credit with teaching me about coverage and acting in coverage. So hmm. the camera was on me first, then it would go, then it went to the master, then it went to Frank last, okay? Directors choose their coverage, their angles for their own reasons. Yep. But it started on for me first. Reason. So on the other side of it, I knew the, I knew the scene really called for Frank to put me in my place because I was an assistant bellman that wasn't really abiding by the codes of the building. I was really uncouth, mm -hmm. to be quite honest. And he was the head bellman who was dealing with all these important billionaires and stuff in New York. And um, so when we did the first few takes, I was like, I was doing my best. I like, I didn't even hesitate. I'm giving, I'm putting colors on every, every line of dialogue. And then, uh, and he was just kind of chilling. And I was just like, in my mind, I was like, this is the, this is the great Frank Langella. Like, that's all you got? I'm like, all right, cool. So I'm just being quiet, doing my job. Bruh, they flipped that camera on his ass for his coverage. This dude came out roaring like freaking Mufasa. Mm -hmm. All kinds of colors on his stuff. Now, somebody would say, well, is, J is Jaleel White being petty? No. What he did was he watched my performance. He studied my performance. He didn't let on to what he was going to do with his performance. And then when the camera was on him, instead of making it an even exchange of, of, of colors and, and matching emotions, he made sure that his performance went way bigger than mine. So when they put the two images together in editing, he still commands the scene. And I was like, after he did it, and he just basically, the full Broadway in him came out, I was like, hey, bro, so you just act when you want to, huh? And he turned to me with my parka on and said, watch <laughs> yourself, young fella. <laughs> it's a grimy story, I a but I love him for it. <laughs> so I have the flip of the story, right? <laughs> I've just showed up to do The Walking Dead. I, my first few episodes, I'm not with the main crew. It's just me and Emily Kenny. We have a separate storyline. Okay. Um, about four or five episodes in, I end up with the main crew. Um, and there's this big scene. There's this big emotional scene um, where I have to like walk into this, 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 my old family's like neighborhood and realize, oh, everyone's dead. And knowing that I'm the, again, same thing, the sitcom kid. I'm the sitcom kid in this big, 
huge drama that like everyone loves and is like you know famous and all of that so i'm ready to go to the wall every take don't care i'm prepped let's go it's a big wide master now for people don't understand the wide you know that your 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 face isn't as seen here so some people kind of modulate their performance according to that i didn't feel like i could afford to do that so i went i went for it after the scene is done Andrew Lincoln comes over. He like kneels down and he touches me on my shoulder. He goes, thank you for going there. Because now I know where I need to go. Thank you for going there immediately. The first time you inspired me to go to where I need to go. And that's, that's the differences in number one. There you, go. you know what I mean? Every, they're both doing the same thing. Yeah. That's a, understand that they're both doing their same thing, right? They're watching your performance and they're seeing, okay, so what is this going to be based on what you're going to bring here? Because you have also been in scenarios where like, you can't go to a place and the other actor's not willing to go there exactly. with you. Cause then it's going to look weird and editing, but for him to choose to come as the man who's been leading this hit show for five years, it's going to continue to be on for the next who the hell knows. Right. Cause they're just not stopping. Right. To come over to the new actor on set and say, thank you for going there. That inspired me to go to where I'm going to go to. I, I remember there was something in me that like cracked open and gave me the ability to do my best work. His humility and his understanding of the work that I was trying to do and the pressure that I was under and addressing that allowed me to do my best Let's work. Go. And that's what I hope we see more of. And particularly towards children, like the amount of times I got checked as a kid, you know what I mean? With actors trying to come in was a whole thing as well. Oh, yeah. um, and that's the thing with like Jerry Levine with, with directors, directors coming in and just kind of being just, just dicks. <laughs> I'm like, I'm 12. I don't know what you like, what are you talking about? Um, and coming in and being like, no, you're an actor. I respect you for what you do. This is hard. Do you understand it? Are you cool with this? How do you feel? I hope we see more of that. And I hope that that's what social media pushes us to be. I do too. Knowing that somebody will speak yeah. on it if you're not. I do too. Uh, even the kid, I don't know if you saw the movie Jojo Rabbit, uh, with uh, mm -hmm. star, the kid Roman Griffin Davis, uh, who was the lead in that. Um, you know, I've never met the kid at all. Uh, I remember Dakota Fanning in, uh, in Man Down. Uh, there's so many performances yep. like that. And those are white kids, but, 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 but we're still, we're, we're bonded. You know what I'm saying? It's like we're we it there is no race on the kid experience. You know what I'm saying? No. The, the the executives add the race on it as they evaluate us individually, which is yeah. which is very sad. Yeah, that's the money which conversation. Is, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Which is very sad. But I'm like, when I saw him, the kid that even starred in Jojo Rabbit, I was like, this is absurd that he wasn't nominated. Absurd. And you know, absurd. again, it's just like the beginning of our conversation that, you know, you it's just something you as a kid are taught to accept. That it's like, oh, that's just the yeah. way it is. Like, I can do my no. best, and and I, I I just can't even want what's going to be given to Mel Gibson or those other people up there. No. I can't even want that. And uh, because there's a there's this idea that you don't understand. Yes. And I'm watching the him work make or deliberate something like moves. that. He's making choices. He's making choices. And like, I was just talking about that last night with my girl about Stranger Things, and I was like, people don't understand what those kids are doing. Those kids can bang. Yes. Like they can come out and they can bang with the rest. They can act circles around adults and they do it. You watch some of those scenes and you're like, mm. <laughs> if I have to say who's the strongest actor in this room, it's going to be the 12 year old. And that's not as understood as it should be. We should be seeing more kids get nominated left and right, because if anything, it's harder. You don't have as much understanding of your, of your emotional spectrum of how to work a joke. There's so many people who go to classes for so much yeah, time yeah, yeah, to learn yeah. all of, you know what I mean? When you're young, you don't have that. You have to feel it out naturally. And that's so much harder to do when no one's going to show you. Um, I, I really hope we see more kids getting nominated and winning. You mean ultimately like winning. I don't think, do any of the Stranger Kids things kids have anything? No, I don't think they've won. Um, that's ridiculous. That's I ridiculous. I don't think they've won. I think Millie Bobby Brown yeah. not having anything is ridiculous. But again, they, they, you know what I mean? because of their following though, Tyler, like they get, they're getting a new level of respect. So that group, yeah. that particular group, you're not going to have to feel sorry for. They may not take home the hardware, yeah. 
you know, I, I'll never forget when Anna Paquin won and an Oscar mm -hmm. for the piano. But more importantly, if you go yeah. look at the if you go look at the the footage on YouTube of when she did win, look at the adults' faces and their reaction. And it's not congratulatory. Mm, after what's it's, it's appalling. Wow. It's it's like I can't believe you did this. You disrespected our years and years in the industry. And it's like, listen, you know, it, there is a part of life that still deserves to be a meritocracy. Good was good. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Excellent was excellent. And mediocre is mediocre. Yeah. Listen, I, I could talk to you, brother. I knew it for like two hours. We got to wrap this thing up. <laughs> so hopefully when this thing, yeah. if this thing ever becomes a show and maybe you and I can go do something, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I heard Duh, I heard you're like an extreme juggler and stuff. I've heard you got some like, uh, <laughs> I, I, is that true? I heard you're an extreme juggler. No, no, I, I don't juggle, but um, I do do things. Um, I, you know, I find different ways to like keep myself entertained and all that. So we have to go through all of that you as well, like hobbies and exactly. Like, you know, how do you stay sane in the midst of exactly. all of this? Exactly, we got to go get some Cirque du Soleil training in Montreal and get some mescal at an a <laughs> underground bar while we're there and continue this conversation, man. It, yeah, absolutely. But I appreciate it. Uh, this is uh, this has been Tyler James Williams from Everybody Hates Chris and The Walking Dead and so much more. His future is so bright. Um, seriously, brother, just actor to actor, thespian to thespian, former child star to former child star. Thank you. My man, thank you for having me.